My name is Yuleen New, and I am the Assembly Member for the 65th District covering Lower Manhattan. Welcome to Represent NYC on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Financial empowerment is about providing economic opportunities and increasing access to financial institutions in all communities, and especially low-income communities. Through financial empowerment, we can uplift our communities and provide them with a pathway out of poverty. Our goal is to even the field and provide our communities with the economic access that they deserve. All consumers deserve fair and transparent banking services. They deserve the ability to have clothes on their backs, food on the table, the opportunity to purchase a home, pay for school, and live a healthy lifestyle while working full time. Today, we'll be discussing economic justice and talking about ways we can work toward empowering our communities in New York. Here to talk about financial empowerment and the most recent developments in this field are Andy Morrison, Campaign Director at the New Economy Project, and Carla Laddie, Supervisor for the Consumer Law Unit at District Council 37. Thank you both for being here today. Thank you for having us. So, Andy, can you tell us a little bit about what you do at the New Economy Project? Sure. New Economy Project is a economic justice organization based in New York City. Uh, we've been working in communities um, for over 20 years, and our mission is to build a new economy that works for all New Yorkers based on principles of racial justice, community and neighborhood equity, and cooperation. That's amazing. Um, Carla, can you tell us a little bit about uh, DC 37, some of the things that you guys do, and what are some of the issues that your members are hearing? Uh, DC 37 is a municipal employees uh, union. We represent uh, public uh, employees in the city. And I am in the uh, legal division at District Council 37. And we are seeing uh, quite a few uh, issues that impact our members negatively. And that is in the, C the, uh, sorry, the student loan area and debt collection area, mm -hmm. and uh, we have a lot of work ahead of us uh, regarding that, those topics. How does New York State generally fare when it comes to addressing financial injustices by certain companies? In some ways, New York uh, does a great job of enforcing its strong laws, um, and one example of that is around uh, predatory payday lending. Um, so in New York State, uh, as in 14 other states around the country, pay, what's known as payday lending is categorically illegal. And that's a really important fundamental public policy we have because uh, for folks who've spent time in other states, as I know you have, um, they'll know that payday lending is a, is a scourge. It, um, it is a high cost loan product that traps people in a cycle of debt. Um, and the industry really targets communities of color in particular um, and charges people 300, 400, 500 percent interest on loans, um, forcing them into a, a cycle of debt that they really can't escape from and has all these cascading um, effects on their lives. And so uh, we're, we're, it's really important that we continue to keep payday lending out of New York. Um, so that's one example where New York has done really a, a great job of um, protecting New Yorkers. So we have very strong usury protections in New York State, um, but that hasn't stopped the industry from trying to break down the back door, right? That's right, yeah. I mean, the, the industry would like nothing more, and they're really salivating at the idea of being able to, um, to make payday loans in New York's communities because it, it would be a big market, and they make a an incredible amount of money. In fact, there was a study that showed that um, New Yorkers save $790 million every year in fees alone from not having payday lending. Um, but to your point, yeah, the industry has kept uh, like banging down the door in New York. And I think the fight to keep payday lending out um, is really kind of emblematic of our broken Albany politics because the industry has used campaign contributions and paid lobbyists to, um, to get elected, some elected officials to entertain the notion of bringing in payday lending when, when it, it, should be, um, it should be a non-starter, really. And so, um, for example, um, the check cashing industry in New York, which has really been brazen about its desire to, to make payday loans, has um, hired now a third lobbyist. So two lobbyists weren't enough. They now have a third paid lobbyist to advance their issues. 
Um, and these are issues that have no public policy rationale other than to serve the interests of uh, the fringe financial services companies. Carla, can you tell us a little bit about the impact that these predatory uh, products have had on your members in the past? It's, it's, it was very devastating to a lot of our members. I mean, they were anxiety ridden, they, they, were, they felt trapped, uh, they didn't have the disposable income that they should have had. They didn't realize uh, the predatory nature of this uh, type of lending. Uh, it was their only uh, recourse in a lot of instances. And actually since about, uh, I guess it was around 2013 to 2014, uh, when the regulatory agencies really got strict and, and made it very clear that uh, these debt collectors were not allowed in the city, uh, the word got out also uh, to our members that this was, these types of loans were illegal. Yeah. And so they, they got the message and uh, were very relieved at that point that they didn't have to give up all this income. Uh, and as Andy was saying, like 70% interest and 700% uh, interest in some of these loans. And our members are now learning alternatives uh, to payday uh, uh, borrowing in that way. DC 37 has actually been on the forefront of this fight to make sure that uh, payday lenders cannot come back into uh, our communities. And so I was wondering if both of you can kind of tell me a little bit about what are community groups doing to kind of defeat these efforts. So what have you guys been doing um, kind of in the background and together? Well, I'd say that uh, what DC 37 is doing, one of the things is uh, besides uh, legislative e efforts trying to put bills, make sure that they uh, go through um, and make sure that predatory lenders stay out of New York um, and don't come back in some other form. We're also educating our members. Uh, financial literacy is so important and we have all sorts of programs where we try to put out the word and let uh, people know that there are ways to grow wealth and you can't do that if you're struggling uh, to survive. In addition to that, I think our, our groups and, you know, DC 37, a new economy project and a whole broad-based coalition of groups from every corner of the state have been active on this fight for, for years. And uh, I think one of, the thing we've, one of the things we've found is that the state hasn't really put forward um, like an, an affirmative agenda for addressing these really deep-seated issues. Because while New York has never had payday lending, and it's something um, we're really, really fortunate and we fought hard to, to keep payday lenders out. Um, that's just, that should just be a given that we're not having predatory lending. Um, what, what the state, I think we really need to see from the state is, is really bold vision for what economic justice should look like at the neighborhood level and to make sure that there's equity um, and fair and affordable services. Um, but also, we have to address the root causes of why people turn to predatory loans to begin with, which is that some people don't have enough money to get from paycheck to paycheck, and that should that should be um, that should be something we're we're like laser focused on. So that means um, living wage policies. That means uh, making sure that uh, we have um, community development financial institutions and credit unions that are serving uh, low income communities equitably. You bring up something that's really important to me. Um, let's tell the audience a little bit more about CDFIs, uh, that's the Community Development Financial Institutions, and the recent effort to fund the New York State uh, CDFI fund. CDFI, it's, it's a little bit of alphabet soup, um, but yeah, it's a Community Development Financial Institution, and these are banks and credit unions and other institutions that have a specific mission to serve low-income communities. And these are the communities that, of course, we know the banks are not serving. The banks continue to redline communities of color. Um, we see that when you look at br bank branch locations, for example, where um, in New York City, there's uh, about three times um, the number of bank branches in white, well-to-do communities compared with um, low-income and, and majority community of color neighborhoods. And so, um, because there isn't bank access in communities, these community development financial institutions really fill um, a, a, a gap we need to be focused on, um, but they need more support from the state. So uh, for example, um, in 2007, the state 
uh, created what's called the Community Development Financial Institution Fund. And the idea is that the state would actually provide grants to these uh, credit unions and banks so that they could do more of this really critical work. Um, but the state never actually appropriated any money uh, to capitalize the fund. So um, it, it's, it, it's this untapped resource that the state has but isn't, isn't making use of. So we and um, elected officials, and I know you led uh, the way on this, and, um, and the, the Senate Democratic Conference uh, led on this, and about 60 groups from around the state, including DC 37 and New Economy Project, said, hey, let's make this be the year that we, wait, that we fund um, community development financial institutions that are doing this critical mission-driven work. Um, unfortunately, the state did not pony up uh, any money in the budget. So what has the state done around CDFIs so far? Really, the, the CDFIs um, are effective because they get um, support at the federal level. Um, really, the state is, isn't doing all that much um, to support these institutions. So this is one of the things we think the state can be doing to put forward this bold affirmative agenda. To, to really ensure that, that um, like for instance, low-income credit unions or, or member-based financial cooperatives that um, are serving low-income communities can expand their reach, um, can do more work to support affordable housing, to support low-income families um, who want to maybe get a mortgage or get um, financial services or open up a bank account. Um, these are credit unions that are doing this with a, a social justice mission. They're, um, working to keep wealth in the community and to build wealth in the community for their members who um, who control the credit union. Do you think that DC 37's members would love to have access to more CDFIs? Oh, definitely, definitely. Many of them are, are also um, already uh, have accounts at some of the credit unions. Uh. So Carla, I just wanted to touch uh, on the student loan bill. I know that this is something that's very, very close to DC-37's heart, and also, um, you know, we know that there's some predatory products out there. With our members, we're finding uh, some abuses by the servicers of these student loans, and they uh, are giving misinformation sometimes to our clients, not the, or they're not the best information, and uh, they are just falling further and further into debt and uh, given these unlimited forbearances and the bill just keeps rising. And uh, so now uh, there is a bill that's uh, being introduced and by uh, the DC 37 is supporting a bill that would uh, allow the Department of Financial Service, Services to uh, regulate and license some of these, these uh, services, these loan, student loan services. We're supporting that, uh, that bill. We're hoping that that will uh, eventually go through. Perfect. Well, thank mm -hmm. you guys so much for coming to speak to us about these important consumer protection issues. And I just wanted to thank you both for uh, being here. So we will be right back. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back. Joining me now is Ariana Lindemeyer, the staff attorney with Mobilization for Justice. Ariana, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. Could you just tell us a little bit about MFJ and what sort of work you do? Sure, Mobilization for Justice uh, used to be called MFY Legal Services. Uh, we're the first ever federally funded anti-poverty organization and we do um, civil legal services for low-income New Yorkers. We provide free legal advice and representation to people who can't afford an attorney. A cap of my district. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> many, many New Yorkers and it's throughout the five boroughs as well. Um, though we do have a special relationship with Lower Manhattan because that's where we've been located for a while. I work in the Consumer Rights Project, so we um, work with people who are dealing with debt collection, financial fraud, and we help with um, providing direct services and also doing policy work um, and some impact litigation. That's amazing. So what are some of the top priorities of uh, MFJ this upcoming legislative session? Um, well, the biggest priority that we have legislatively would be uh, your bill, actually, to amend General Business Law 349. 
which is a long overdue bill that we're very excited about. Tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, just uh, not everyone knows about General Business Law 349, <laughs> um, but it's basically a way to make it easier for victims of dishonest businesses to get relief in court. Um, and it also helps government find and punish these businesses. So what it does now is that it bans deceptive business acts and practices. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't go much further than that. It doesn't deal with unfair, unlawful, or abusive acts and practices. Um, and th about 39 other states have a much broader ban than New York does. So we think that now is time for New York to conform with the nationwide standard protect its residents from dishonest businesses, and uh, level the playing field for honest businesses. So the bill basically adds in a couple of words to make it so that we are actually uh, making the same kind of protections uh, all around our country, right? Yeah, it's not revolutionary. Um, it's, it's just bringing us in line with what other states are doing. And this is conduct that I think when you hear examples of it, everyone thinks that it's wrong and that it shouldn't be allowed. Um, so there's a real question about why it's not included already. So we're a progressive state, uh, but sometimes very backwards in some of our statutes. Uh, what other protections can we offer to consumers in New York State? Um, well, one that was addressed a bit in the last segment would be um, better oversight of student loan servicers. So, for example, um, licensing them, making sure that the Department of Financial Services can conduct exa examinations of them. Um, because we really want to make sure that um, student loan borrowers are aware of their rights, um, aware of some of the great repayment options that are available to them already, like income-based repayment plans, and that they aren't steered towards more detrimental options like forbearance or even just defaults. Um, and we also just want to make sure that they get accurate account information or really any account information at all, which currently is a struggle for student loan borrowers. We in my district see a lot of uh, consumer protection fraud. Um, what are some of the other things that you guys have seen and helped clients with? Um, so one common thing that comes up a lot um, which isn't currently covered by the general business law but would be covered by the amendment is um, debt collectors taking, for example, like an elderly person's social security. That money is exempt from collection. Um, but a lot of times when a debt collector knows that um, and they don't return it, um, that person doesn't have a right to sue them under the law because there hasn't necessarily been like a misrepresentation or a lie. But that's still unfair conduct and that's conduct that we as a state don't want to happen. Would something like unfair practices in tenant protections uh, be a part of this as well? Um, yeah, it would actually. Um, so for example, um, landlords who uh, refuse to accept certain subsidized vouchers like Section 8 or who um, uh, sue their tenants for rent that they know that the tenants don't owe. Um, like for example, the government portion of a Section 8 voucher. Um, we have uh, clients who are being sued repeatedly for amounts that they just aren't required to pay. Um, and particularly with gentrification on the rise in New York, this is a tool that landlords use to try to wear people down and force them out of their buildings because they know that dealing with yet another lawsuit is going to be challenging. And sometimes people just give up because that's, um, that's a rational decision. So right now in my district, for example, there is a uh, very big fraudulent scam where um, it's been on the news lately where a person has been calling saying that they're from the Chinese embassy and it's been in Mandarin targeting towards seniors and uh, people who speak Chinese and so something like this would also fall under this law correct? Yes definitely and you'll see I mean just to tie this with the financial services that, that were discussed in the last segment when you have a community that um, that isn't uh, making enough money to, to make it to their next paycheck and are being denied access to other financial services that are fair, um, they're going to be um, exploited. They're just kind of vulnerable to scams and exploitations. And uh, particularly with um, non-English speaking communities, um, you have to rely on the resources that you have in your own language, which gives just like another opportunity for scammers to try to take advantage. So tell me a little bit about some of the work that you guys have been doing in Lower Manhattan. 
We have been working on, MFJ has a bunch of different projects, so we do a lot of housing work um, and trying to help make sure that tenants in, in Lower Manhattan stay in their buildings and get the, um, in, are able to enjoy the rights that they have under the Rent Stabilization Code. Um, we also help people who are um, dealing with debt collectors, you know, elderly people who want to know their rights, um, be able to figure out what's the best way to use the limited income that they have and to make sure that they're not driven towards things like bankruptcy um, just because they're being harassed by debt collectors day in and day out. We also have um, a disability rights project, um, an employment justice project, and, and we really provide like a full gamut of civil legal services. It's great to see the holistic uh, aspects of it because, you know, as we see you guys being defensive on making sure that, you know, people are not falling prey to deceptive practices, but you're also trying to help people to become whole again. We talked a little bit about CDFIs in the last segment. Um, is there uh, something that you guys are doing on the asset building front? Well, we do support funding the CDFI funds. There are already institutions in New York that have expertise in helping people um, build their assets, and there are consum uh, community development financial institutions and community development credit unions. So we see our role as being able to support them and help advocate for them to get more funding so that they can expand more because frankly, you know, a lot of the banks that a lot of the times that I interact with the bank is when they're not um, honoring my clients rights under the law and it can be very, very difficult sometimes for an individual to go up against their bank when the bank is just slamming the door to them. You know, we want to make sure that people have like a wide range of options so that all the businesses that are available understand that they need to provide good services to their customers in order to keep them. So what are the requirements for getting services from you guys? Well, we don't have firm income guidelines, but we do prioritize low income New Yorkers. Um, basically, as long as you have an, er an issue that we can help on, so a civil issue as opposed to, say, criminal, um, and you're a low-income New Yorker who resides in the five boroughs, we can definitely at least provide you some advice. And how do we get in contact with you? Well, we have um, a whole bunch of different hotlines. Um, and, uh, you know, if someone's not really sure which project they would fall into, it would make sense for them to call our main line. And um, our excellent support staff would steer them towards the right project. And in terms of your mentioning holistic services, um, although we do bring affirmative cases, um, we can't bring all of the ones that come through our door because people do come to us when they need help. And um, we have to think about which cases we really have the resources to bring. And so sometimes we refer people to private attorneys. And a lot of times we get the response from people of, well, that's nice, but I can't afford a private attorney. Sure. I mean, I might have lost thousands of dollars because of this scam, but the legal bill that I might get is going to be much more than that. Um, so one thing that's so great about the bill that you introduced is that it helps deal with this access to justice issue by making sure that um, that if a person wins um, in one of these lawsuits, the other side will be covering their attorney's fees. And it makes, it makes that a guarantee as opposed to just a possibility. And what that does is it helps people, um, it helps open the courthouse doors to them. And that's not just good for the victim of the dishonest conduct, but that's good for everyone who lives in New York. Because everyone who lives in New York is potentially a target for that same business. That's right. Really, it's just such a comprehensive way of dealing with the, the limitations of the law. So I have one more question for you about that. Um, so with this bill and the way that it is structured now and where it is at right now, what can we do legislatively? Um, what's the push now when, as we move it? Call your legislators. Call your elected officials and tell them that this bill is important to you. Um, because it's the kind of bill that it's so broad. And as you mentioned before, it covers so much different sort of, so many different kinds of bad conduct. Uh, uh, debt collection, um, it covers landlord-tenant issues, um, bail bonds abuses, um, even the Equifax breach that affected half of the country. Um, this is um, the kind of problem that is so broad that everyone should be on board um, and supporting it. Really, unless you're a dishonest business, there's no reason that you wouldn't support this bill. But at the same time, it's because it's so broad, it's not necessarily something that's on everyone's minds all the time or on their, their agenda. So I think it's really important for people to call their elected representatives and let them know how important this bill is to them. 
And actually, we've been talking a lot about consumer protection, but this bill goes even beyond just protecting consumers because it also helps small businesses who are um, victims of other business conduct. Um, and that's something that currently, the way the courts have read the law that exists now, they've limited it so that a business can't necessarily sue under it. And I don't think that's something that the legislature ever intended. So what this amendment does is it corrects that, that problem and makes sure that you know, a small business, a mom and pop shop that's just trying to earn a living, when they get scammed by someone, they have a right to sue as well. So one of those examples would be um, one of those vendors who uh, has these really extensive contracts, right, and makes it so that even after you've paid for the product itself, um, they take it back and you have to keep on paying. You read my mind. That's <laughs> exactly um, one of the scams that we've seen at a Mobilization for Justice um, proliferating against these. I wouldn't even call them small businesses. They're almost like micro businesses, oftentimes family run, a sole owner. Um, they have very few employees, maybe run out of their home. And um, there's one scam in particular that has been the subject of a lawsuit by the New York Attorney General where um, people are leasing, are, are getting really tricked into signing leases for credit card machines. Mm. Um, sometimes, you know, the terms are always much more onerous than what had been disclosed to them. Sometimes their signatures are forged. Sometimes a secretary is um, being tricked into personally guaranteeing the business's wow. loans. And then when the equipment either doesn't arrive or it's broken, they're told that they're still on the hook for the lease. And this company is signing these contracts and pushing these contracts throughout the country under New York law with a right to sue in New York courts. And you wonder, well, why New York? And then you realize that it's because New York has really left the door open to these sorts of scams. Um, and so, you know, now's the time is to close that door and say, we don't want you relying on New York um, to take advantage of small businesses. And you had mentioned the difference between civil court and criminal court. Could you elaborate a little bit? Because when something like this happens to somebody, people usually think, that's a crime against me. What does, you know, so can you elaborate a little bit about the difference so that our audience can help themselves? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of times um, this conduct is both a crime and um, still a civil action. So, um, for example, if you're defrauded, fraud is a crime. And while I'm not a criminal attorney, you know, there are cases in which that could be a crime. Um, the difference is that it's going to be the government um, and the, the people of the state um, who would decide whether or not to pursue that criminal um, element in court. Um, but that doesn't mean that the victim is totally out of luck if it turns out that the district attorney, for example, doesn't bring a case. They can still file a civil case where they would be the plaintiff and the business that harmed them would be the defendant. Um, and if anyone feels that they've been um, victimized in this way and they would like to try to pursue a civil remedy, they should contact the legal services office and we can at least give them a sense of what their options are. Thank you so much, Ariana, because this is going to be so helpful for the consumers of New York State. Thank you. I really appreciate your coming. My pleasure. Thank you to all my guests for taking the time to chat with us today about economic justice and consumer protections. As a state, we need to invest in infrastructure to make it easier for consumers to have access to fair financial services and continue looking at different ways to help our underbanked communities. My name is Yulene New, the Assembly Member for the 65th District, and you can follow me on Twitter at Yulene, spelled Y-U-H-L-I-N-E. Thank you for watching Represent NYC on MNN. Good night. <music>